the biggest independent comic book of the last five years just got optioned again. The most popular, trending comic books in the marketplace and our Overstreet Price Guide Advisor will hit you at number 10. Number 10 on the list, Blue Book. Number one, this is the Comics Pro variant. We are seeing $45 average sales and a high raw sale of $75 for this amazing in Hyuk Lee variant. Now, this is a new book for some people, but for the people that have been paying attention to James T., he dropped this a little over a year ago. If you've watched this channel for any amount of time, you know Tom and I have pretty much been talking nonstop about James Tynan's Substack, The Empire of the Tiny Onion, and Blue Book was the very first project that he released exclusively on that platform until now, because it's now available through Dark Horse. A book that we've already read came out all of last year through James Tynan's Substack following a couple's experience and encounter with UFOs, a nonfiction tale that's already on volume two discussing another encounter. Yeah, Volume 2 deals with the Kenneth Arnold Washington State Mount Rainier sighting, which is a local story to us, and that's actually the uh, impetus for the term flying saucer, so that's kind of cool. Before you get to that, though, you have to experience the Betty and Barney Hill abduction story that you're going to find in Volume Number 1, and this isn't the only Substack narrative that's hit press. If you enjoy this, you're going to definitely want to check out The Closet. If you want, you can try and track down all those issues or just go check out James Tynan's Substack, Google it, and uh, you spend like seven bucks for a month and you can read all this stuff on there already. So while you can probably go to your local comic shop and still grab issue number one right off the wall, the Comics Pro variant is going to be super tough to find. The Comics Pro variants are released at the Retailer Summit, which was at Pittsburgh this last weekend. There probably were fewer than a thousand of these handed out, so this book is going to continue to climb. Let's talk about Janine Godby, Elizabeth Tyne. At number nine, we have Amazing Spider-Man, The Lost Years, issue number one. This debuted in 1995. This was a large print run. When you're in the 90s, these were printed, and they were pretty good quality as well. So you can find a lot of high-grade copies in dollar bins. This is hitting $15 average sales, 9.8s at $150. There was a newsstand sale for $257. And this is the character who would become Ben Riley's love interest, a prominent figure in the Beyond storyline, and eventually become Hollow's Eve. We are seeing a 113% increase in copies sold this week. And while it was a high print run book from the 1990s, there are not that many slabs. There are only 34 copies at a CGC 9.8. This book is definitely one that I think people are going to be looking after. There's some cool foil on the cover, but the fact that they brought back this character after almost 30 years in absentia, she's really looking to be a mainstay. Marvel's known for taking their antagonists and giving them some depth, giving them some problems and making them more relatable. Hollow's Eve, I think, is largely popping right now because of the excellent job at marketing that Marvel did. The character was introduced back in time last year in October for Halloween because she's a Halloween-themed character, uses masks to transform herself so that she can get abilities, get out of situations, and cause a ruckus. Well, her debut in Amazing Spider-Man 14 spiked up the book, and at that time, they had already been soliciting and had announced the fact that she was going to get her own miniseries, which debuted this week, causing this book, the first appearance of Janine, to spike. We're already a good ways into this video. We're about to hit number eight. So you might as well go hit the like button. It's just, it's right there. Go oh, hit it. It's a really good suggestion. It's a way to support the show. Also, you can hit subscribe too you know, while you're there. That's optional. We're not really good at this, but at number eight, we're going to talk about some Century news. I do love the Century. I'm a fan of the modern age, and this is the Century number one. His first appearance from the year 2000, we are seeing $130 average sales with a recent high 9.8 sale of $525. An increase of 117%. We talked about this book back when the news broke that there was casting being made for a evil version of Superman. A lot of people looked at Sentry. A lot of people looked at Hyperion. I mean, this is Thunderbolt casting. Maybe we're looking at Squadron Sinister. Well, Steven Yoon News shattered the internet this week. Yeah, we just got news that he had uh, signed up to join the Thunderbolts in an undisclosed role. And apparently there have been multiple sources saying that this role will be the Sentry. I love how Ryan refers to this as a modern book and it's still 23 years old, which is one of the reasons why we have so many copies on the CGC census. 1,259 copies to be exact. And that's actually nine more than the last time we talked about this on the Hot 10 on January 9th. So a lot of people are getting this book graded and it is a black cover. So it's already susceptible to fingerprints and kind of damages. I actually think one of the sleepers that people need to be paying attention to is that there is a San Diego comic 
Comic-Con variant of this book with an amazing Jay Lee cover. Obviously, you know Stephen Yoon from The Walking Dead and from Invincible, where he plays the main character's voice, but you got to check out the first episode of I Think You Should Leave with Tim Robinson. He steals the show, and I had to slip that in there before Tom and Russ shut me down. Also, read New Avengers by Brian Michael Bendis for a big, big uh, part well, of the century. He's all over that run. And that brings us to number seven with Super Mario number one that debuted in 1990. Valiant goodness, difficult to acquire in high grade. With the movie debuting early April, the second trailer dropped recently, giving us a peek at something that every Nintendo fan was hoping they'd get. Shots of Mario Kart, battles between Donkey Kong, Jack Black Bowser is going to be a great movie. Shots of Mario going into the galaxy. Luigi's Haunted Mansion vibes. This is everything we wanted. We're seeing $150 average sale on this book, and there is a 150% increase in copies sold this week. A recent CGC 9.8 went for $1,999. That was just about a month ago. But we have to keep in mind that in back in 2022, we actually saw a copy go for $2,999. And even in 2021, we saw a book go for an all-time high of $3,100 for a CGC 9.8. Eight. This is actually down, and this book right now has never been hotter. The minute they started announcing who was going to be playing the voices for a lot of these characters, that's when I got on board. I, I'm a big fan of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Charlie Day is going to be playing Luigi, which I'm very excited for. Jack Black as Bowser is like the casting of my dreams. Did you see him <laughs> dressed up? That they, He dressed up in the Bowser costume on the Kelly Clarkson show recently. It's a little silly, but I loved it. I had a great time watching that. I'm very excited also to see Seth Rogen as Donkey Kong. I'm not really sure how that's going to work, but I don't care. I'm excited. I'm actually excited to watch this movie, which I did not think <laughs> I would say ever. Did you guys notice that Jack Black, they had to blur out the bottom portion of him, probably because his junk was showing? He's a little, a little excited to be dressed up as uh, Bowser. <laughs> On that, on that stage. I don't really know what was happening there, but it was kind of funny. Jack Black is a national treasure. Number six on the list is Spider-Man India number one. $65 average sales, a high sale for a 9.8, 320 bucks. Now, the heights on GPA that this book reached was $1,000, but it was kind of short-lived. I mean, that was right around the time this book was hitting its peak where there was a lot of six and seven hundred dollar sales a 157 percent increase in copies sold on the first appearance of pavitir prabhakar because we have casting information of an actor tom and i are very excited about a lot of you know him as the taxi driver in deadpool however i know him as the first victim in one of my all-time favorite movies shout out mark duplass Creep number two. Maybe I'm just a hater, but I prefer creep one to creep two. I think I'm wrong, but I don't care. He gets his own, it's just desserts. It's worth it. Many people know Karan Sani portraying Dopinder as the taxi driver in both Deadpool 1 and 2. No news on if he's going to reprise the role for Deadpool 3, but we do know that he's going to be voicing this Spider-Man India in the next Spider-Verse movie. Correct. Across the Spider-Verse. It's coming out in just a few months. And just last week, we actually got a first peek at all of the Funko Pops, including this right here, this shot of Spider-Man India, so we can get a shot of what he looks like in the movie. And now we're at number five on the list with Battle Chasers number one debuting in 1998, seeing $25 average sales, $250 for a 9.8. This book almost reached $300 highs at that grade. It hasn't dipped that much, largely because of the giant fandom. A lot of people who love the comics, but even more who fell in love because of the game. This is absolutely Joe Mad's passion project. He's been putting so much work into this since 1998. The book started out at Image Comics, and by issue number five, it got obtained by DC Comics and was released under their cliffhanger imprint. The big thing was that there were so many delays between issues. Most of these issues had almost six months between all of the issues, with the worst delay being 16 months between issues six and seven. Now, we did see a renewed interest last year when there was a JRPG released for mobile and a couple other platforms people remembered how much they liked this book and now i think that's why we are finally seeing after 22 years an issue number 10 to actually wrap up the saga now joe matt has been teasing the release of issue 10 for over a year now showing that the script was done that art was being taken care of so that's why we've seen some spikes and People probably holding on to their books because they knew that there was something coming. And with the conclusion of the arc, I'm excited to see what's next. So compared to last week, we are seeing a 700% increase in copies sold. You also have to remember that this was optioned for a TV show back in 2021 by Derek Kolstad, the creator and writer of John Wick. So this book could really be going places when you factor in the return of the comic, the video game, 
and an upcoming TV show. We call that a triple threat. Yo, I'm sitting in front of this book right here, House of Secrets 92. If you want to get a foil alt perspective, Gabriel Del Auto reprint, hit commentom101.com. But I'm giving this away on whatnot at the end of the month when I attend MegaCon. Join myself. I know Davis Ryder is going and a lot of other homies. On the app, link in the description, support the show, and we're selling comics cheaper than eBay over there, and I'm giving this bad boy away. We're all the way down to number four on the list now. We're talking about Deadly Neighborhood Spider-Man, issue number five that just came out last week. I'm hearing mixed reviews about the current Amazing Spider-Man Zeb Wells run. I'm in it for the long term for anything Amazing Spider-Man. It's on my poll list. It's more about how many copies I'm deciding to get. However, if that run isn't doing it for you, this book will. Seeing $15 average sales, $30 raw sales. This is like a different narrative, completely out of continuity, and way more about the fun aspects of the art the wickedness of the comic book, the depth of the inks, and the brightness of the colors. So like Tom mentioned, this is a sort of side story miniseries, uh, Deadly Neighborhood Spider-Man. This issue, number five, is the first appearance of Crystal Katani as the Dream Spider. She did appear as herself back in the first issue of this miniseries, but in this issue this week, she becomes her own sort of spider character. Peter Parker finds himself in L.A.? in a horror narrative. I mean, we got Demon Bear in this, you know, him dealing with the nightmare realm. I mean, it's very different, but it's so stylized that every issue is a must read. And I really got on this at issue three when Peach Momoko did her horror cover. It was so stellar that I had to go backwards and get caught up now. It's this issue, issue five, where Crystal becomes Dream Spider that is making this book pop off. And I think it's just, honestly, just because she's got a cool design. She kind of looks like a carnage symbiote sort of style outfit, but... A little sexier. A little sexier than Carnage. Carnage is already pretty sexy, but this takes it to another level. And now we're at number three with a difficult-to-acquire oversized magazine that came out in 1975 that tells the narrative of a story that debuted in book in 1951, probably because producers are hunting for the next Last of Us. Number three on the list, Unknown Worlds of Science Fiction, number one. Again, this is from Curtis Magazine in 1975, and this is the first comic book version of The Day of the Triffids, which is a classic British horror novel. And it was made into this made-for-TV movie by the BBC in the mid-1970s. If you guys are a fan of, like, the Tom Baker era of Doctor Who, that's exactly how terrible these special effects look. It's just, like, they found some guy with a scarf and a thing and taped some eyes to his head and had him walk around. It is really some of the worst sci-fi, but it is so classic. And like Ryan was saying, it's quintessentially British. At the end, they're like, oh, we gotta go off to Sussex to go do a thing. I mean, it's really, really awesome. But even though it's magazine size, we do have 26 copies of it at a 9.8, $65 average sales if you can find one, and a recent high of $595 for, again, a CDC 9.8, and that was made on the same day that another copy sold at $349. So this book is keeping climbing. 74 copies exist on the census. It's gonna cost a little bit more money to get this one graded because it's bigger, but CGC will slab them. And there's a total of 26 copies at 9.8. Tough to acquire. Horror has a very deep and long lineage, and it's very tough to talk about a show like Last of Us where you have fungus people without even thinking about Day of the Triffids or Invasion of the Body Snatchers. And the fact that Day of the Triffids was influenced so heavily by War of the Worlds, this book very much influenced a lot of other things like 28 Days Later or Bird Box. It features a guy that is in the hospital who's got his eyes covered up, and then when he comes out, the rest of the world has basically been blinded by a meteor shower, and they're all getting eaten and attacked by these killer plants. It is really crazy, but you can see a lot of these influences in much of the horror that came after. And now we're at number two with Sick Tick, Something is Killing the Children, issue number six. The first appearance of Aaron and Cecilia Slaughter supporting cast for this beloved independent run by James Tynan IV, Jimmy T. We have updates on the option news that people have been waiting for since like 2021. Something is Killing the Children. I refuse to call it Sick Tick was previously optioned by Mike Flanagan, who directed Dr. Sleep. He created the shows Midnight Mass and The Haunting of Hill House on Netflix. Both are very popular. However, his most recent show, Midnight Club, not as popular. So he left Netflix, went over to Amazon, thereby killing. Something is killing the children. 
until it was recently picked up again by a new creative team, the creators of Dark on Netflix. After the dip, there's a renewed interest, an increase of 633%. And this is a more affordable key in the run. $60 average sales, $130 for a CGC 9.8. The heights that this book reached was $350 for the same reason. Supporting characters are great to spec on because they're probably going to be in the show. That's correct, especially in the first season 15 issues of Something is Killing the Children. Aaron Slaughter and Cecilia Slaughter are very, very important side characters. So they, they got to be in here. This, this makes a lot of sense that we're seeing this book in particular spike. I've said this a few times. And I just want to get it on record again. If they decide to change the title's name to something else, it'll probably be House of Slaughter. Don't sleep on those really affordable House of Slaughter number ones. Also, that whole first arc of House of Slaughter gets into detail on the character we're talking about here in this issue, Aaron Slaughter. It gets into his backstory and everything, so... It's a good read, too. Now, I was going to surprise the mail call community. We already have a Darkwing Duck slated one per box by Johnny Desjardins. Trade dress and virgins going out in the March mystery mail call. But also one per box, we have a Zoo or Zoo, Maxine, Book of Slaughter cover going in, virgins going out at random. It's a thick book, $10 MSRP. It was pricey. But for the comic fam, we go all out. ComicTom101.com to join. Link in the description. And Russ, hit him with the number one trending book. The most popular funny book in the world. Because it ain't that funny. Number one on the list, Sick Tick number one. Still, it something is killing the children <laughs> number you. one. Thank it you. doesn't feel right. I get it. $325 average sales. The last sale of a CGC 9.8 was $679. Two days before that, we had a sale for $880. Two days before that, we saw one at $1,000. Buy it now. People are selling these books. This is good news, and it's a 400% increase in copies sold. These prices just keep getting lower. I'm starting to feel a little bit of FOMO, but the fact that it's going to Netflix has really held me back from investing in this title. I can't think of any comic properties that have really pushed values of comics up on Netflix. Sweet Tooth, anything from Mark Millar, Lock and Key, dare I say even Sandman is down, and that was excellent. That's really true. If you start thinking about the Millarverse stuff, Sandman was really popular but didn't spike. When you looked at the Sweet Tooth, it bumped a little bit, but realistically, these books aren't seeing the heights that people were expecting when they're made into a Netflix show. I have a weird, weirdly strong obsession with anything that HBO does. I think they, they kill it. Every show they make is gorgeous and perfect, and it, I agree with Tom. If this had come to HBO, uh, I think we'd be seeing a lot more hype for this. Something about Netflix stuff hasn't really landed with me, even when they're adapting something I'm a fan of, like The Witcher, for example. I got bored, and I barely finished the first season. Haven't gone back yet. However, we're talking about something that's killing the children. This is issue number one. First appearance of Erica Slaughter. First appearance of literally every other real character that's going to be a big part of the story, including the first glimpse of the Ascura type, the monsters that you see, the things that are killing the children throughout this whole, this whole story, at least this whole first story arc. Regardless of it being Netflix, Erica Slaughter is one of the best protagonists in comic books to be introduced in upwards of a decade. I think we can all agree. This book could go the distance, but will it reach the $2,100 heights that it did back in 2021? I got to know your thoughts in the comment section below. Am I going to regret buying this book just like I did for Last of Us? And, as always, geek responsibly. Nuh? Said. Comic fam, I'm so proud of every single one of you. Thank you so much for coming out. Over on Whatnot last week, we raised $2,000 for comic books for kids, and we didn't stop there. We teamed up with the best new app to buy and sell collectibles, Whatnot, Key Collector Comics, and CBSI, and a bunch of our friends to print in excess of 1,750 brand new comics that have already been donated, and they're on their way to hospitals, to make children's day a little bit better whether they find themselves at a hospital or a cancer center across the u.s thank you so much gem mint collectibles nerdy girl comics and carnivore comics and of course we also have to mention comic pops davis rider and comic books for kids and big thank you to you russ milky comics heron heavens the mystery mail call members who all combined efforts to do some good comic books for kids doesn't just assist children, but they also serve troops as well. Comic books for veterans. So I think there's a lot more we can do this year. You can come follow us on Whatnot, where we're making the magic happen. Have a great week. Thank you so much from the bottom of my heart, and we'll see you soon.